the official stripes of going against the grain. Welcome back to the Drum Rundown. We are here again at the Marathon Music Works, and I'm here with Matt Halpern of Periphery. What's up, man? What's up, dude? What's going on? So we were Shows. here like uh, about a year ago with uh, the guitar guys, and I was shooting the rig rundown over there in the boat, and you were setting up, and I was just like, man, come on. This is just like painful to not get to sit down with you. But here we are, yep. full circle. We're getting it done. Yes, sir. So go and check that rig rundown out. It's awesome. Let's talk about this, uh, which is your rig yes we've got a lot of custom signature stuff up here for you let's start with the kit cool uh yeah. and we'll go we'll go from there so what do you got kit wise so this is a pearl masterworks kit um i've always loved the pearl reference models um specifically the music city customs yeah so when we built this kit um speaking with john at pearl who's actually here today um somewhere uh we just based it off of the reference shells okay. that the MCC typically will come with. Um, I just love that sound. We just did some custom sizes. So uh, I have a bunch of drums in this particular drum kit as a whole, but on tour, I kind of always tend to change it up. So on this kit, we have bigger toms based on the music that we're playing. So this one's a 13 by seven. Uh, we have a 16 by 16 floor and then a uh, 16 by 18 floor. So um, just big, boomy, yeah. Boomy drums. Um, and again, I, I have such ADD when it comes to like my sound with the tom specifically. So you'll catch me sometimes playing a 10 inch tom, 14, 16, or some variation of, or two toms up front. But for now, this is what we got. Um, the kick drum in particular is a, uh, I believe it's a 22 by 16. So like the depth is actually a bit shorter than the yeah. traditional 18s. I just find that you get more control, more mm -hmm. punch out of it that way. Uh, and it, it's kind of, like, that's the one thing I, I typically do not change okay. on my kit, whether I'm in the studio, whether I'm playing live, the 16 depth, 22 circumference is like where it's at yeah. for me, for my sound that I like. So, uh, we also have my signature snare drum here on the kit. Uh, so I worked with Pearl to develop this and we released it. I want to say back in 2021, I think. Uh, and it's, it's been on the market since, and I've gotten some great feedback on it and it's really just you know, we designed this based on my, my true personal preference of what a snare drum should sound like, feel like, look like. Uh, so it's a, it's a 14 by six inch uh, depth here. I have, uh, I have these three uh, small vents yep. around the circumference just to help with controlling the sound, making it a little bit more dry naturally. Um, and then I personally, uh, I like, again, a lot of control over the sound. I like to give Alex, our, our sound guy, um, a lot of control over the sound too. So typically the more dry it is up here, um, the more he can kind of add to it out right. front. So uh, it comes standard with the, uh, so when it when the snare drum ships, if you were to buy it, it comes with the Evans Heavyweight Dry Head. Yeah. Which funny enough is a, is a drum head I developed with Evans um, it started off with just the Evans regular heavyweight, mm -hmm. and I wanted something a little bit more dry. So I said, hey, why not take that one and punch some holes in it yeah. and make it a little bit more dry? And then that became uh, one of the heads that, that anybody can get now. So it ships with the uh, Evans heavyweight dry. And then again, depending on the room that we're in, depending on the sound control that I want, uh, I threw a Minel Drum Honey on this one that I always use the brass snare weight. Yeah. Um, I find that it just, it's like, 
if nothing else, the perfect dampener that is on the market. Yeah, just, Snareway has figured that, it out. Like I love yeah. the leather ones and I love seeing this one. Yeah, it's I have it very, on, very awesome on all my snares. Yeah, and I yeah. love that you did this uh, this hybrid drive, the heavyweight with the holes, because that's such an interesting drum. You don't see them a lot. Yeah, you know they throw a lot of air kind of up when you hit them. It's kind of like a trip. Absolutely, uh, but it's it's really cool to see you kind of sending s something super dry to front of house so that they can kind of fix it for the room. Yeah, and honestly, like if I take if I were to just take off even like this drum, honey, you would hear so much body to the snare drum it's a it's a brass shell so you get a lot of natural resonance uh it's got die cast tubes so you get a lot of natural like crack from it yeah. you know when you hit it you get a lot of that resonance as well so it's a vibrant drum with a bit of temperance to it and uh it just it it smacks and i think too it sounds good whether you tune it up or whether you bring it down or anywhere yeah. in the middle you can get a really nice fat body out of it no matter what it just depends on on your preference and so. a tuning range in a snare drum is so important uh, especially in studio applications and then obviously live if you want to crank it or drop it yep you went with a six inch which Depth. is kind of like uh, this goldilocks thing it's not a six and a half it's not a five what how did yeah. you get to six that's a very specific uh, you know it initially when i was when i was uh when i was trying to figure out the the drum sound and size that i wanted it was really based off of like kind of the positioning and my height. I find that a six and a half ends up sitting a little bit too okay. high for most snare drum stands and the way that I like to play it. So for myself, just accommodation wise, I went with uh, with experimenting with a six and then it ended up sounding awesome. That's it was, cool. And it, it was kind of like two pronged in that it was exactly what I wanted in terms of feel and sound, I guess we found out, but then it does fill a gap in the market too. Yeah. Because sure. there really aren't a lot of six inch depth yeah, snare drums. You don't right. really see 14 by six quite a bit. So uh, so it made sense across the board. Yeah, and way. as people think more about drum mechanics and kind of body tension and getting like ergonomics correct, I think filling a gap in the market with that six inch snare, I mean, it's certainly something that I'd like to try because there is always just that little extra where you're breaking sticks because you just, you wish you had a little bit more room. A hundred percent, yeah, exactly. So that's uh, that's kind of what, uh, what we came up with. And I, I use these, um, these uh i forget the rock locks rock locks thank you by the yeah. homie yes anthony yeah by anthony yes yeah. thank you yeah so you shout the, out to anthony these things are awesome anthony gazelle um yeah i use the rock locks uh i find that they have they've definitely been like the best control yeah. for making sure that it does stay in tune um he nailed I, it i mean it's like talking about filling a gap in the market there were so many attempts at getting that right and i feel like we're, we're kind of there yeah and it's such a pain to deal with most of the time yeah. these are actually easy to put on and off you can mm -hmm. you can take them off pretty quickly you can put them back on so um i found it to be a great product too so yeah that's that's pretty much the setup as far as the drum heads uh so i again i'm all about having control over the sound so on the kick drum uh on the batter side i have a uh, evans emat heavyweight which uh, is obviously a thicker two ply head. It's got the reinforcement ring to help mm -hmm. control the sound better. So that's been a staple for me for a long time. And then the toms, when the UV2s came out, it just, it immediately, it was like the perfect drum head. So I don't, I typically don't even need to change the heads on a torque. That's incredible. Because they hold up so well. And I hit pretty hard. Yeah. These, I mean, you can see so far, I mean, if you feel them too, there are no in, indentations uh, on them it, whatsoever. They barely look played. Yeah. And they sound great. They're great. They're really responsive. Tons of attack. So since they came out, that has definitely been my go-to. I used to play the Evans G2 Clears, which are also great heads. Yeah. But I would tend to go through them more. I feel like the sound is pretty similar to those heads. And you also get the durability and even more attack out of them with the UV2s. Even more so, attack than a clear head, which sounds I think so. I mean, counterintuitive. You can... Yeah. Just flicking them. You, it's, right. it's a, you can hear the strike on it you know if yeah. that makes sense um and then bottom heads uh for the toms i typically just use g1 clears okay keep pretty standard simple. yeah uh uh what's it called the snare side uh 300 okay. underneath and that's it in terms of the drums man nice pretty straightforward awesome yeah well, let's get into symbols because they are just as important and i know you got some signature ones up here as well for minor i do i do so we could start with the with the crashes on the kit so i i've played so many different types of crash symbols over the years. Um, but with Meinl, I think as with most people, I've always gravitated towards the Byzant symbols. Um, and I've tried to find symbols that have a really nice sort of vibrant 
sound and, and tonality to them, but ones that don't have too much overtone yeah. or too much like lasting power that can cut into the vocal mics or the other stage mics, um, even in the studio. So I landed on the, uh, the extra thin hammers. So this is, uh, this is the extra thin hammered crashed uh, Byzance, uh, it's a 20 inch. This one is the same model as an 18 inch. My good buddy, Mike Johnston, who a lot of people know as mikeslessons.com, uh, calls this symbol thunder butter okay. <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> yeah. It's got a lot of attack, you know, like when you initially hit it, but again, they don't carry uh, over the line, so to speak. Like they're, they're really nicely controlled. They're very, they're just, I don't know, they're my favorite crash symbols of all time, pretty much. Um, and I find that they feel good. They're nice and thin. It looks like I'm hitting really hard when I'm playing the cymbals, but I'm actually not. Yeah. Um, I try to really like- Just Hitting them correctly. Hitting, try to hit yeah. them correctly, yes. Because yes. there is like a, a relationship, especially with this uh, kind of cymbal, that there's a, a point where you have diminishing returns. You hit it too hard, it chokes out, it doesn't do the thing it's supposed to do. 100%, and with them being thinner cymbals, they, you know, a lot of drummers will break these. So if you do end up getting these cymbals, one, you don't need to hit them too hard because they respond better yeah. with a lighter touch. And two, just be aware, they are thinner. Yeah. So you want to be a little bit careful. But if I can play them and not break them, right. anybody can. Yeah. So well, I think sonically they're such a great fit for what you do because of the style of music that you play. Um, you need to kind of cut and get in and get out because there's a lot of frequencies happening and Absolutely. you need to kind of sit in a specific range and, yep. and have it. And you're, you know, the, with the linear kind of fills and things that are happening, it's like one in and out and it's not stepping on the other things, which I think is super important for you. Absolutely. And the tonal, the tonal, like the importance of each symbol having its own space within the context of the, you know, like the sound live and like uh, sort of just like the, the tones in the music. I play a lot of accents on the symbols with different pieces of the kit and I don't want them all to sound the same by any means. Right. So there's, there's, you can hear three distinct mm -hmm. tones in just these three symbols, plus obviously everything else. But sure. so I try to have symbols that sound nicely different from each other, but still have certain qualities that, like you said, are required to cut through, yeah. but not stay for too long. Yeah. You know, so those are the crashes that I have, uh, you know, really made part of, I think, my signature live sound. Uh, as far as the splash goes, so this is a Byzance uh, eight inch splash, and I kind of sometimes will change up between like an eight inch or a 10 inch, but I think the eight is my favorite. Yeah, okay. Um, it just, it cuts, it's a beautiful symbol. I don't know, I just, I've always loved, loved this one. Um, Hi-hats, so top and bottom are different. Uh, I've, I, I always experiment with hi-hat symbols, just different, different tonalities. I play a lot of left foot hi-hat chicks. Mm -hmm. um, I need a, a very like staccato sound as well when I'm playing with like the tips of the sticks and playing some more intricate patterns. And then I want a nice wash that isn't too loud. So a while back, and I, it's funny, I don't even remember the specs of this particular top symbol, but uh, Meinl made uh, some R&D hi-hats for me. They're 15 inch as, as far as the size. And it's kind of similar to like a sand hat, uh, but it's a little bit thicker, a little bit more, more attack to it. You can get like, you know, like that you can hear the bell really nicely. The attack on top. Yeah. Very, very much staccato. But if you open it up. I love how dry that is. Get a nice dry sound. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's also obviously accentuated by the bottom symbol, which is a 15 inch uh, foundry reserve bottom. Okay. And the foundry reserve symbols are absolutely beautiful. Uh, and typically at home or like for certain other gigs, I will use a top foundry reserve and a bottom foundry reserve. They're just a little bit more delicate for the sound that's required for right. periphery. Yeah. So I tend to get, I, I put this top symbol on, which I just am in love with. And again, it doesn't even have a name. It's just an R&D yeah. <laughs> symbol that they Some made Some of the best me. ones are just uh, one of one. Absolutely, exactly. So uh, this combo, I, I found like, you know. That get shreds. It. And it cuts through the whole room. That bell is so cool. On yeah, a, thanks, man. On a set of hi-hats. Yep. I think yep. a lot of ride symbols wish they had a bell like that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, and like you can hear throughout the whole room how much even just the hi-hat chicks will cut through, which is a big part of our sound. Uh, so 
yeah, absolutely in love with this hi-hat setup. Um, and I think the, the, the lesson here, the moral of that story is like play around with different hi-hat setups because right. even though these cymbals are very different individually, when they are put together, they work very well. Yeah. So whatever cymbals you have, mess around with them and see what you come up with. It's a similar concept to stacks, which I see yeah. one there, which is, you know, play around with different combinations of things. How did you get to that? Yeah, so this is just like hard tested on the road. So this was uh, outside of having signature drumsticks from Promark. I want to say uh, this was like the first big signature piece of gear that I developed. Uh, I was using, uh, I've always used a 18 inch China with, t it was a, a 16 inch crash to make my stack in this kind of configuration. And then when I started talking to Meinl about it, we just started playing around with different, different size uh, top symbols and ended up that the 18, 17 combo. Okay. So an 18 inch Byzance, uh, China where, so this top part, like similar to how th this China is positioned here, it's the same as this one. So this top part is lathed just like this, but the bottom side is hand hammered. Okay. So you get a nice, again, like a, a nice attack that has a nice sort of wash to it or like <sighs> sound to it, uh, but it, it decays quickly and it's very versatile. And then same thing with the crash symbol here. Uh, the, the bottom side of the crash, so similar to what would be under here, is lathed, but the other side of it, and I can even take it off just to show you, is, uh, is hand hammered as well. Very cool. And just through experimentation with, with this combo, we found that lathed on lathed sounds a little bit too choked, okay. and hand hammered on hand hammered sounds a little bit too choked, but when you put hand hammered onto lathed, you get this really perfect mix of the two metal, two, two types of, of, uh, of metal textures rubbing together. And it looks striking. It's yeah. so cool to have both of those finishes. Yes, absolutely. And Beautiful. what's cool about this, so you can use the symbols individually too. Right. If you didn't want to stack them, you couldn't, or you could. Uh, but you can also, so this is the one configuration where you lay the uh, crash inside the china this way, but you could also do it to where you flip it around, and now you have lathe on hand hammered as well. There you go. But just the, the different, the different setup, and you get a much more controlled, much more quiet sound out of it versus what you get with the other configuration here, which is quite a bit more abrasive naturally, and it. Yeah, sounds better when you have it tightened down, so you can really get the friction. Right. Um, but here, I'll I'll show you what that what that sounds like. So that really cuts through, and it, I typically will tighten this down pretty aggressively. You're just trying to get the most quick, almost chick out of it. Yeah. Man, and that's that awesome. Really cuts through. So yeah, this has just been my go-to China, and then uh, Meinl was, uh, was, was, they were trusting in me enough to create something that we could put out on the market, and it's done really well. So it's called the double down stack for the purpose of having the symbols be very versatile, and you can double it, meaning yeah. you can do it both different configurations or take them and play with them separately. That's super cool, and I love the yeah. way that they nest in. There's just something that, like you said, your OCD. I, I love yeah. the way that the diameters kind of nest in, in both configurations, it's very cool. Yeah, I mean. Versatility it, in symbols is like. It's huge. It's huge. And if you have the opportunity, which I'm extremely grateful for, to experiment, then you should try all different combinations until you get it right. And it took us some time, but this has been the result. And, uh, it's definitely been a huge staple of, of the band's sound cool. as a whole. So yeah, for sure. Nice. And then after we had some success with, with the double down stack, we started working on the double down crash ride, which is a slightly different story. But basically I, I had been looking for, so I, I previously was playing with a ride here and a crash here, and it was just too much. And I, I wanted to kind of minimize the drum kit a bit and also find a symbol that I could use all, all around. So like it has a bell that's very striking. It has a nice sort of ride sound when you get outside of the, of the bell of the cymbal, um, but you can crash the crap out of it too. Yeah. So it's also called the double down crash ride, similar to the double down stack in that it is made the same way. So the top part of the cymbal 
is hand hammered and the bottom is lathe. And you get a really nice wash out of it. You get a really nice attack out of it. The bell cuts through, but similar to the extra thin hammered, it decays really nicely and it doesn't wash out everything on stage either. It's a big symbol. Uh, it definitely has a lot of presence in the room, but it by no means is like stepping on any toes, yeah. if that makes sense. And I just, it's my favorite ride crash symbol. And it, again, it's allowed me to take away another crash over here and just be a little bit more efficient with the setup, nice. you know? So I love this symbol. Uh, and it, what's cool is in the past week, actually, I've gotten some feedback from some amazing drummers who also play Minel, who had the experience of, of shooting some content with this. Um, and they've given me like amazing feedback on it. So it's really nice to hear it from like yeah. friends that I trust as, I won't say names, I don't know if they want to be mentioned. So, but people that are incredible drummers telling me, Hey, this is like, this turned out great, great job with it. So that's always nice to hear that feedback. And that's very cool. What was cool was I had a prototype made and, uh, I shot a bunch of content with Minel and with Pearl. Um, and it's funny at Sweetwater too, we shot a whole bunch of stuff and the comments were like, what is that ride? What is that ride? What is that ride? So I basically just took a bunch of screenshots and brought it to mine. I was like, look, people are really interested. Yeah. Maybe we should do something with it. And they were like, yeah, we agree. So here it is. There it is. Yeah, so there it is. Double down. Yeah, cool. and what's cool about these is they have the periphery dots yeah. on them. There's a little stamp so, on there. Nice little stamp, yeah. yeah. Can you hit cool. that for the folks back home? Yeah, yeah, so bell. The bow. Decays nicely, and then crash. See how it doesn't let, like we can literally start talking yeah, pretty much right away. Yeah, and it, even sitting at ground zero, it's not crazy. No. It's, uh, it's very reined in. We worked a lot of, we put a lot of time into trying to get the bell right to where, because a, a lot of times when you have a crash ride, the bell doesn't really cut yeah. because it is too much of a crash. So we spent a lot of time really honing in what the bell is going to sound like. And, and I literally do have OCD, so like it shows in these symbols. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no joke. So yeah, so that's the crash ride. And then uh, over here is my all time favorite China yeah. symbol ever. I think, I personally think it is the best China symbol ever made. You, you can hear me talk about this on podcasts. You, I've said this so many <laughs> times, but the Byzance 20 inch China by Mino symbols is by far the best China symbol of all time. Um, it just has the perfect tone. It's so consistent and it's uh, like, I, I don't know, just, it's the one I've tried the 22 inch. I've tried the 18 inch. I've tried different variations and there's nothing like this symbol. Yeah. This is the best China symbol period. Again, it is a thinner material. It's a, it, so this is a traditional, so it's not like brilliant or anything like that. Um, you got to play it right. It can break if you beat the crap out of it, but if you play the symbols correctly, they will hold up and they will sound amazing. And again, if I can use good symbol technique and not break them, so can you. So just don't bash them, learn how to like play with them and use the movement. And funny enough, I mean, obviously on the China and the stack, I use a top felt to control the sound a bit, mm -hmm. but you can see here on my crash ride on the two crashes, I don't use a top felt. I just really like the natural movement of the cymbals. And I play a lot, like I'm doing this as I'm yeah. showing you, like I do this a lot. And it's kind of like a, like, a, like a speed bag in boxing. Right. I want the full range of motion so that... You play on the bounce back. You play on the bounce back. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you're not getting any spidering. You're not getting any cracking or anything in the actual... No, and I think that helps. Area. I think that helps. Like allowing the cymbal to fully move and, and reverberate the way it naturally should, I think preserves the symbol as well. And Instead of hyper-focusing all the vibration to one point and then locking it down and trapping all the vibrations in there and then wondering why your symbols are all spidered. Yep, right? exactly. Yeah. And I know you're doing something specific in the stick too though that's kind of helping you with the dynamics because you have a 2B, yep. but you have it modified. I know that there's more weight in the end, correct? Yes. And in the shoulder, so that kind of helps with the balance and the power. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's a standard 2B, it's 16 inches, which is like your standard, most standard six from Promark. Um, it's got a shorter taper, which helps with the weight distribution up top here. And then I use like a pretty, pretty bald, uh, like B-A-L-L-E-D head, not bald like my head, yeah. <laughs> um, bald tip, uh, just because I, I, I like the way that it 
it sort of creates contact with the drum. It's a fatter, uh, it's a it's a fatter point of of connection. So like when I when it falls, it's like you can see. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, ground that's covered by the tip of this. Mm -hmm. It's not just like one small point. Right. Or it's not like too bald where like you're putting dents in it. You get a really nice attack, even if you hit lightly. And that's a combination of the heads with the the throw of the stick and with the uh, the shape of this particular beat of the stick yeah too and again into technique wrist and throw and power from the wrist and not from the arm yeah i mean even like just just the fingers you know like you know you could either let it fall from here without any fingers still get it or you can just here that's all that combined yeah. right wrist throw fingers all in one and you get that really nice smack to it what's so incredible about the head configuration and how you have the tom set up and obviously the depth choices is how much kind of vibrance and just articulation you're getting out of the drum and how much it sings. Yeah. Especially with a coded scenario. Yeah. Uh, it's sure. a very cool sound. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Myself and uh, my former bandmate business partner, Adam Get Good or Nolly, as people know him yeah. by, have spent hours and hours and hours in the studio finding the perfect tunings for each different drum size uh owning a we own a, a drum sample company right so we have to have drums that sound good so we've really put a scientific uh method to it and we've sort of figured out the right pitches for for at least for my sound um, but typically for most uh drums based on the configuration of what the wood is uh what the shells are in terms of size what the hardware is and we have a lot of a lot of data that just kind of shows that hey this is what sounds good for this size drum this is what sound good sounds good for this size drum yeah. so on and so forth so i try to not be lazy with it and uh and really use that stuff live because it, it does make a difference earlier in the tour um i wasn't as on top of tuning i was a little bit more like yeah let's try doing some stuff by ear and then it even just it didn't feel right didn't sound fully right so i i uh went back to my little my little notebook found the right tunings for these particular drums that I have written down somewhere and uh, tuned them up. So um, I don't know if it's a secret sauce that Nolly wants me to share or not, but we do have like very particular tunings for the top head, bottom head and how they work together. Yeah, I was gonna say in terms of like the get good drum stuff, like to see you kind of take any of that science and apply it to the live scenario is yeah. kind of crazy. Very makes cool. a big difference, it yeah. really does. The kick has a nice punch uh. to it. Yeah, you get a nice, nice fat punch. Tom's, you know, they, they work well together. Snare. Yes. Everything is right in that perfect spot for, at least for my sound, what I like, for attack, tone, uh, and you know, this nice, nice shock value of how much the snare drum has a lot of crack to it. When yeah, play, so. you're doing a great job of curating a nice color palette uh, across the cymbals and keeping them all in a, in a tonal family and the heads and the toms are no different. Yeah. Cool, one of the last things, we got Pearl kick pedals down there. Yes, so I've experimented with a bunch of the different Pearl pedals. I, I keep coming back to the Eliminators. Yep. Uh, so these are the Pearl Redline Eliminators. Uh, they're just reliable, I've used them for years, even before I was uh, I was I was playing Pearl drums officially, you know I always played Pearl pedals, uh, and they're just they're reliable. They're great. They're they're pretty straightforward. The design hasn't really changed much over the years, and that's really nice to have that reliability. I've done some things to them to to kind of make them a bit more um, I, I guess personal for me. I've, I've put some uh, a little bit stronger springs on them, which you can get. I've I've changed some of the the little like the features and stuff. But again, that's all personal preference. Right. It's not for everybody. People ask me all the time if I use a chain drive or a direct drive. So I like I don't use long boards. I like standard pedal length, uh, and I use uh, I use chains. Always yep. have. I Dang. just I like the like the full feel of the pedal. You know, I grew up playing rock music, pop music, stuff like that. Never had a need for. Uh, a direct drive pedal. Yeah. So even now, it, it kind of makes my life a little bit harder playing fast double bass stuff, but I'd rather have that because the majority of what we play just really is, you know, it's rock drum parts. Yeah. And I like that feel. So yeah, these pedals are uh, all faithful for me. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, I, so I have the Minel Drum Honey uh, mutes on each drum. And again, it's just because I like to give Alex at front of house 
as much control as possible. It doesn't mean I would always use those. In the studio, I might change it up. Uh, different, different live setting, I might change it up. But in a venue like this, that has a lot of, a lot of room sound. Yeah. I want to give him as much control as possible. Right. And I mean, it sounds great. So we've, uh, we've had some comments here and there on our YouTube page about that. I'd love to get you to talk about it since you are kind of like the tone guy. Sure. Approaching that dry mix. A lot of times we hear, you know, drums in context of the drum rundown and it's like, wow, the drums sound so dry and crappy. And it's like, yeah, it's for the room, right? So can you speak a little bit of why you have decided to send such a dry mix to front of house, which it might sound weird if we took a mix off the board per se. Sure. And how it sounds incredible every night. Yeah, well, I mean, in a room like this, you can see it's high ceilings. There's tons of different materials in the room. You have brick, you have metal, you have wood, you have different kinds of metal, you have glass, you have all these different sounds that are going to reverberate, and it, it creates a very sort of echoey sound that could be very hard to control. It's like if you were in a big room and you, you yelled or clapped, you have no control over the way the sound travels. So when you have microphones that are picking up a drum, in concert with the sound of a room, you don't want drums that are as like uncontrolled and lively as the room already is because that just makes it even harder to control. So you can't necessarily control every aspect of the room that you're in, especially in a venue like this where you're here for one day and then you're out, but you can control the input, right? You can right. control what the drums sound like at their organic starting point. So therefore, having them be as controlled as possible allows for Alex, who's at front of house for us, to have more of it, I mean, I keep using this word, but more control and more ability to work with the room and not have the drums sound uh, out of control. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Obviously right now with the room being empty, it's a lot, there's a lot more reverb in it. There's a lot more big room sound than it will sound with a, a full house of people. 600 people later, yeah. Right, however many it is and it's like, Way that, more than 600. I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah. it could be, it, it, it may be 600. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it very well may be. But, but, you know, even that, it's like, if half the room is full, it's going to sound different than if the whole room is full versus what it sounds like if the room is empty. Yeah. So it, it, it can change based on the amount of dampening that takes place from human bodies versus whatever other materials are in the room. So I think if you're playing in a, in a place like this and you're looking for the best possible drum sound you have control over the way that you can dampen the drums and sort of, uh, you know, ha help the tone be a little bit more tweakable out front. Right. And tuning, of course, will absolutely help. A lot of drummers just, you know, they, they put heads on the drums, they, they, they tune them finger tight like I used to do. And that's fine, you'll get a really nice punchy sound, but if you're looking for tone and the ability to have the drums cut through the mix, then you wanna have, again, you want to experiment with like, okay, what tunings will work for the top head, bottom head for each individual drum size. And if, if me and Nolly can sit down and, and figure it out, anybody can, you yeah. know, it's just, it's just a matter of patience and experimenting with different drum heads with different, different tunings and just uh, seeing what works. And you'll notice to, to round this out, different rooms will make the drums sound different yep. too. So having again, a bit more control at the source, right? that's the consistent sort of like control piece, you know? Um, and then with the rooms being variable and, 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 you know, changing from day to day on tour, at least something is consistent. Yeah. And then you can tweak it just based on the room instead of having to tweak these drums that are, you know, really right. boomy and, and big and too, too vibrant and so on and so forth. So. Yeah. It's a nice tight baseline. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to add reverb than to take it away. I've yeah. heard. And don't get me wrong. You don't want to dampen them too much. Sure. So I think, right, you, you'll sometimes see drummers that have more of these types of, uh, of dampeners on the kit than necessary, or like the drums are, are too loose to where they're so dead that they have no tone. And then you're in like a, almost like it's too dry. It's, it's yeah. too dead. Right. So there is, a, there is a nice balance, I think, that you can, you can create, so. Cool, well, yeah. thanks Hope for uh, giving us some insight on how to get good drum tones. Absolutely. See what I did there? I do, I do see what you did there. Cool. That was great. Thanks for hanging out with us, Dude, yeah. Matt from Periphery. This has been the Drum Rundown. We will see you guys on the next one.